All right. So, um, Pastor Tom Bates and I had a bet over a year ago. Now, Tom is on a cruise this week, but when he gets back, I want you to rub this in because he's not here. Tom's in charge of all the mentoring. He's training and equipping all of our marriage mentors. And a year ago, I said, we'll have over 100 weddings this year. He said, there's no way. I said, we'll have over 100. He said, I'll bet you a glass of your unsweet green tea from Starbucks we won't. I mean, you know, pastors don't have any money, so we don't, we don't wager a whole lot, you know, it's tea. And so um, I said, you're on. And so just a couple of weeks ago, I won. We, had, we have over 105 weddings scheduled for this year. So I just want you to know, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Tom usually wins all the different bets. It's Tom 30 and now Kurt won, but I got one. I got one. But I also want you to know that this time, last year, we had half as many weddings. We've now, for 2020, already doubled the number of weddings who have deposited. And it's just, it's just really cool to see what God is doing. So I want to talk about this today. And the question is, I'm not married, why should I pay attention? Or I'm, I'm Joanne, and I'm 90 years old, and I've lost my husband, you know, a few years ago, Herman. What, why should I pay attention today? I, I want you to, to hear me on this clearly. We're going to talk about today not the how of marriage. We're going to talk about the why of marriage. Because everything you see is how. Watch this. That's what you see. And when we started building this wedding chapel, we realized that all the material out there was how to fight fair, how to do a budget, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to, and nobody talked about why. And so Tom Goodlett and I began researching this on why did God create marriage. We couldn't find anything. We could not find material on why we found the how. But the irony is, if you don't know why, the how is a little bit superfluous. Now, those of you that have taught a teenager to drive, you want to teach them why safety is a really big deal driving, not just how to drive. Because you know as an adult that not everybody stops at a four-way stop. You know that not everybody, because the light is red, stops. You know that even though the light's green, not to go. You know that how from experience. And so we're not just teaching people how to do this marriage. We're starting with the big why, and we couldn't find it. So we've, we've crafted this our, ourselves together. And so the, the important part to us is, is session one is why. Now, I want to say this again. I've married over 600 couples in 38 years. And I ask these couples before they get married, why do you think God created marriage? And not one couple, not one couple in 38 years knows why God created marriage. Well, I think it's to be happy. I think it's because she's hot. I think it's because, I mean, you know, you, you, you go through the list and you're just sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so here, here's what we did as a senior leadership team. God gave us a vision to change the trajectory of marriage. But how we were going to do that was to have a tool that would be used for weddings. And so we decided to build a wedding chapel that was drop-dead gorgeous that would catch the attention of every bride around here. We had no idea it was going to go a lot bigger than that. We had no idea that right now we've done 15 different states. We had no idea that this would become a wedding destination. But God has taken this little bitty idea and blown it up far bigger and greater than we could ever dream or imagine. And so what's so cool about this, though, is once you understand the why, the how begins to fall into place. There's more motivation. Let me give you some examples again. If you were a fireman and you came to our house for dinner and you told me how to change the smoke detectors or how to check the smoke detectors, that's great. You tell me why I need to check the smoke detectors, that, that's a game changer. If you're my mom and I'm four or five years old and we're going out to the beach and you're trying to get one of those 
orange life jackets on me, those scratchy, itchy life jackets, and, and you're, I'm going to fight you as a little four-year-old boy. And so I, you're, you're telling me how to put the life jacket on. You tell me why. You say, hey, Kurt, mommy loves you, and mommy wants to grow old with you, and little boys don't always do good at the beach, and so I want you to have no problem. You just told me why. I don't like jacket any more than I did five seconds ago, but you told me why. I'm going to put it on. Today is not the how. Material is every plethora of material on how to fight fair, how to do a budget, how to get along with in-laws, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to. This is not today. Today is the big why. And again, even if you're not married or you're divorced or you're a widower or you're, you're a widow, it is essential that we all understand this. Because you've got family, you've got friends, you've got coworkers, you've got neighbors. I think it's critical that all of us, as the family of God, be able to be crystal clear. Because again, I want to say this. I'm O for 600. Not one couple yet has really understood what I'm going to teach you today. And there are five C's. And they're going to be a quiz. And nobody gets to go home or have lunch until you get all five of these. Okay? I'm going I'm to hold you. Not really. But there's five of these, and you can get this. And if you're new to our church this morning, download the Harborside app, and all this is in there, and, and memorize these five. So today is five major reasons why God created marriage. Here's the first one. God created marriage so that a man and a woman would experience companionship. Say companionship. Companionship. Let's look at some of the scriptures. The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. Now, what's so interesting about this is Adam was alone. And what most scientists believe is that Adam was alone for about 25 years before there was Eve. And I'll explain that. So the next scripture that goes with this is God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. He closed up the place with, with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man, and he brought her. Circle the word brought in your mind. What God did in Genesis is he brings all the animals to Adam. And if you notice carefully, Adam's sitting on a rock or on a stump somewhere, and all the animals are brought to him. Now, because of all the billions of species, we kind of begin to think that this took place in like seven days or 10 days or 12 days. Scientists believe it was 25 years. It was 25 years poor old Adam was sitting out there, and he was naming, you know, the hippo hippopotamus, the rhinoceros, the giraffe, you know. And no wonder nothing looked good to him. I mean, thank God it didn't, right? And, and so he was alone. And there was nothing that he got excited about because who gets excited about the hippo, right? And so he, he's alone and he's lonely. And, and the Bible clearly communicates this is now uh, going to be companionship. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. So when Adam wakes up after 25 years of naming all the species, God brings to him this gorgeous woman. Now, that's the Hebrew translation. I think Adam said, oh, baby, where have you been all my life? <laughs> that's what I really think he said, okay? And so there's this companionship. And, and the whole point is, is that you grow old together. You are together going through life. So one of the big C's, one of the big reasons why God created marriage is for you to have a companion. Here's the second one. Second one is compliment. Now, notice how it's spelled. It's spelled correctly. C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T means I like your watch, I like your shoes, I like your blouse, your dress, your suit, whatever. So that, that's, I'm compl that's not what this word is. This is C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the reason that this compliment works is that you and your spouse hopefully are very different. You and your spouse, one of you is good at this, one of you is good at this. And if you're both good at this and neither one of you are good at this, you've probably got a problem. And we don't see this. We begin to argue and fight and fuss because the spouse is not like you. 
and you're really good at money, but he's not, or, or she's not, or she's really good with relationships, and, and you're not, and, and maybe he's really good with communication, and, and you're not, or, 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 he, or she's really good with confrontation, and, and you're not. The whole point is, you don't want to be the same. The whole point is, God put you together to complement each other. But here's what we do. We go out and we gripe and we complain to other people, men with men, women with women, about how the spouse isn't like you or isn't good at all the things that you're good at. I hope he's not. I hope she's not. The whole point was God would make you very different. And if you can embrace that, you're good at money and he's not. You're good at the children and he's got to have a little bit. Whatever it is, it's not the point. The point, the whole point is you were meant to fill each other's gaps. Remember the, the Rocky movie? Rocky said, I got gaps and she's got gaps, but together we ain't got no gaps. It's a lot of good theology from Rocky Balboa. <laughs> That's the point. And, and so in a wedding, sometimes we do the sand ceremony. This is the guy and this is the lady. And in the sand ceremony, it's really cool how the two become one. And, and the point is, you complement each other. And, and you, can't, you can't separate this. It's all one. And the purpose then is to be, when you're different and you complement each other, you make a better product. By the way, there's only two primary reasons why people get a divorce. There's only two primary reasons. And I've been reading for the last 30 years, sex and money. I vehemently disagree with both of those. Because sex and money are the result of the two things I'm going to share with you. Sex and money are not the issue. They are the result of some other things. The number one reason why, and by the way, by the way, everybody that I have ever married has been in love. There's never been a person in my office sitting there who has not been in love. So if everyone's in love, how come 50% make it and 50% don't? It's not about love because I've never married anybody. Nobody's walked down the aisle saying, you know what, I'm really not in love with her. You know, I'm, he's kind of an idiot. You know, I don't think it's going to work, you know. <laughs> Nobody does that. At least not to me they don't, Okay. No one's done that. Everybody. There's two primary reasons why people get divorced. Number one, lack of skills. Lack of skills. And so we don't do premarital um, um, counseling. We, we, all we do at Harborside, seven sessions. The pastor who marries you does this one. Then we hand this over to a marriage mentor and the couple's already filled out a questionnaire on 300 questions. He's filled out a 300 questionnaire. She fills out a 300 questionnaire. It spits you out into 10 different categories. And all 10 ca categories reveal who you are. It's not right or wrong. It just reveals who you are. And then the marriage mentors go to work on skills, 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 skills. The primary reason people get divorced is lack of skills. I haven't married a couple yet who's not been in love. I'm not saying it ain't going to happen, but so far, everyone madly head over heels in love. And somebody will say to me, well, we've been married 20 years. We've got 20 years of experience. No, you don't. you got two years of experience 10 times over. You're at the exact same skill that you were 18, 20 years ago. The number one reason why people get a divorce is lack of skills. Number two. They don't have a mission bigger than themselves. It's my money, my job, our, my vacation, my house, my, my, our, 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 our. And all the arrows point inwardly. None of the arrows point outwardly. And if you don't have a mission bigger than yourself, bigger than the couple, bigger than the relationship, you will get bored. It's a matter of five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It's just a matter of time, and then temptation seeks in. Every couple who does not have a mission bigger than themselves, you're in trouble. Isn't it interesting how people who don't even go to church can be married 50 or 60 years? Why is that? 
And why is it the people inside the church don't stay married? Because there are people outside the church who've learned the skills. And so as a church, we put God into the skills, and it can be just a winning combination. So you learn to compliment each other. Or you learn to complain about each other. Complaining is the kiss of death. You gripe and you complain about your spouse, and I can tell you where your marriage is headed. You learn, you know what? She's not real good at this, but I am. She's gone, he's not sharpest knife in the drawer over here, okay? But I got this. And, and, and I'm telling you, Danita and I are polar opposites in so many ways. And it's that, and, and I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really see some of this early on. I didn't really value that. I, I, I like everybody else, think everybody else should be like me, right? Isn't that how we all think? Am I the only self-centered, narcissistic person in the room? <laughs> we all think that way. And, and yet God's going, it's, it's like this with Adam and Eve. Maybe Adam's got the big picture, <laughs> <laughs> and he needs a suitable helper. And so he's like, Eve, I don't know where to put the daffodils. Where do we put the daffodils, you know? And she's like, oh, honey, that's so easy. We put the daffodils over here in the garden. I mean, this is how it's supposed to work. Instead of this, it's to, it's to compliment each other. Well, the next one is connected. God created marriage so a male and female would be deeply connected. Hans and Lisette, come on out. And I'm going to illustrate this with... Uh, this is uh, one of Harborside's power couples right here, Hans and Lisette Mattelis. They've been married for about three years, and they're going to represent here a team. Now, these are, these are Patriot jerseys, and I just want you to know that we looked for Colts jerseys, but because the Colts are so popular, all their jerseys were sold out. <laughs> these were some leftovers we found, you know, at a flea market somewhere, and uh, I actually know um, we went online and started to order some Bucks jerseys for this illustration and had no idea that, that his and her jerseys were so expensive. So he said, this isn't, we're, we're going to save the church money. And so I called Steve and Jennifer Benjamin. And Steve and Jennifer sit right down here, second hour, and these are their jerseys. The point is, they're connected. You're on the same team. You got each other's back. He is to always have her back. This, is, this works because you're short. <laughs> she is to always have his back, and this couple does that. And they're, they're on the same team. And with Steve and Jennifer, Steve for 25 years has been traveling, has gone Monday through Thursday of every week, and, and she is a mother of four boys, and so Jennifer, you know, just puts the family together. If they weren't on the same team, if they weren't on the same page, this thing would never work. And so you guys, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are, they're, they're awesome, okay? You're to be deeply connected. So the connection goes like this. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become what? They become one flesh. Now, I love the bucks, the lightning, the rays. I love offshore fishing. I love all that stuff. And... Um, I go to the games with different guys and different guy friends, and it's great, and it's fun, and I enjoy it. I'd rather be with Danita any time, any day of the week. We are connected. I'd rather be with her at home than even, you know, some other places that are, that are great. We're connected. I, I most of the time enjoy offshore fishing with her, except she outfishes me. And she'll have three grouper in the boat, but I've been baiting her hook. I've been setting her up for success. And she will say to me, I got three fish in the boat, big boy. How many do you have? <laughs> I'm helping you, honey. <laughs> and so most of the time, I enjoy offshore fishing. Not all the time. The point is, you're, you're, you're to be connected. And this is one of the great privileges that a husband and wife has. So the first one is companionship. Second one is compliment, and now we're on connected. Ready? Companionship, compliment, connected. All three of you. Ready? Companionship, 
compliment connected. There's going to be a quiz, okay? The next one is children. And God created marriage to provide a nurturing and loving family for children. I know this isn't popular today. I know this is going to be a barb to some people. I don't, I don't mean it this way. I know some of you are single moms. I know some of you are single dads. And I know you're doing your best. You've been handed, you know, a lemon and you're making lemonade out of it. I, I get that. But I got to be honest with you. Plan A is a man and a woman together for life pouring into their children. And that's plan A. You don't want me to preach plan B, do you? Maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> you don't. It's a plan. So, so why? Why did God do this? Now, it's not to say that you can't do a great job as a single mom, great job as a single dad. The death, it's not, not to say you can't do that. But there's something that the man and the woman together put in and pour in to, to those children. And, and I've thought about this. What if I would die, I would have died, or we've gotten divorced? Um, what would the children not have received because they grew up in an all, you know, with, with Danita? Or, or the other way around. What, what in the world would have happened if Danita would have died or we've gotten to divorce? And I thought about Erica, Ethan, and Emily. Y'all would have been in counseling for the next 30 years, you know. But, but, but I thought about that there's things that we contribute to, to, the, to the situation, to the marriage. And so I, I've thought about this even like with me. And Danita was so relational. And, you know, she would teach like the ABCs with songs, and I mean, the kids are just having a good time, and, and every woman sets the tone for her home. The men do not. Every woman sets the tone for her home. And, and then I think about what, what would the kids not have received had I not been a part of the situation? And, and she's, you know, teaching them music and song and homeschool and art and just, you know, great relationships and connection and communication. I couldn't wait to get the kids in the car and talk about leadership, talk about business, talk about strategy. I couldn't wait to teach my kids economics. I couldn't wait to teach my kids. And so, so again, it's, it's, it's what you do together as a family. And then together as a family... We would pray and have family devotions. And so, again, they saw mom and dad both. It's just, it's plan A. Plan A was for a man and for a woman to have children uh, together. Here's what he says. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth and subdue it. One of the reasons why God created marriage was for you to have godly offspring. I know a pastor who will not marry a couple if they say they don't want to have children. I thought that was interesting. And I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, but I asked him, I said, tell me why you won't marry a couple if they won't have children. He said, because they're selfish. I said, okay. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that was his view and that was his value because he realized that one of the primary purposes of marriage was for you to have what? godly offspring. The last one, well, that's a picture of the family. Look at her eyes. Isn't she cute? Little girl there, just so cute. And again, they work together. They contribute to this and bring joy to the home. The last one is contribute. God created marriage with the intention that a couple would be able to contribute. And so I, I want you to see the job description. Again, you ask most couples, why do you want to get married? Because we love each other because we want to be together, because, you know, but, but this, this is a job description. God has a mission for every married couple. God, God has a, an adventure for every married couple. And so here's the job description. Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, the, the point of this is, again, I said earlier there's only two primary reasons why couples get divorced. Primary. Number one, lack of skills. And number two, all the arrows point inward. It's all about me. It's all about us, our vacation, our money, our schedules, our truck, our, you know, how. It's all about us. 
And, and the problem with that is that's not why God created you to get married. Now, all that's great. You can be, have a great companion, tremendous connection. You can compliment each other. You can have children. But the primary reason, the primary reason the Heavenly Father created marriage was so that the two of you together would make a better product. The two of you together would contribute greatly to whatever causes God has in mind. And so at some point, you got to figure out your, and I use this, this picture because it shows an adventure. And this couple's on an adventure. And, and what your mission can be, I don't know what your mission is. When we explain this in session one, couples are asking, well, what, what's our mission? I don't know. I don't have to know. But you do. You've got to ask. You've got to pray. You've got to fast and seek that out. You've got to ask what your mission is. And, and, and so your mission might be to, you know, be a marriage mentor. Your, your mission might be to make a lot of money and support missions around the world. Your mission might be to volunteer at the Youth Sheriff's Ranch. Your mission might be to teach Sunday school for the next 30 years. I don't know what your mission is. I know you have one. And I know he crafted one and put one inside of you. And I know this, if all of your life is about you, you will get bored. I've had a front row seat for 38 years. And the couples who get bored are always the couples who never have a mission or a vision bigger than themselves. So let me ask you this question. Are all the arrows going inside? Is it all about you? Or is it bigger than you? Lord, show us. Lord, teach us. Lord, Lord, tell us. What's the adventure that you want to have us on? And so two years ago, we have begun to teach every couple who gets married in our wedding chapel this first session. They're blown away. My favorite was an undercover pol uh, police officer. <laughs> I got through this first lesson, and he said, what the H-E-L-L? -L? He said, what the H-E-L-L? -L? He said, I never knew God did all that. <laughs> he doesn't know you don't cuss in front of the preacher, and you don't cuss at church. You may cuss outside the church, but you don't cuss in the church, right, to the preacher. I love that. He was so brutally honest. I never knew God did all that. Most people don't. God was so strategic. God had such a vision for you before the foundation of the earth. So it is essential, even if you're in high school, even if you're in college, even if you're a young adult and you're not married and you've got a few years to go, it's essential. If you're a widower, and again, you're my friend Joanne who's 90. Joanne needs to know this. Joanne's got great-grandchildren that she's going to have influence. You've got family. You've got friends. You've got neighbors. Everybody needs to know the big why. And God's taken this marriage vision with a wedding ministry, and he's changing the trajectory of marriage in the country. It's just like, who would have thought this little bitty church in Safety Harbor, Florida, is going to influence our entire country? But that would be just like God, taking a little bitty church, giving a little bitty vision, and then God blows up the vision far bigger, far greater than you could ever dream or imagine. Because then he gets all the glory because, you know, we could see about this much, but God had this much in store. And you've bought into this. This doesn't work without you. So we ask you to help us raise the funds for the wedding chapel. And we asked you to provide $1.8 million. We had a million dollars in the bank. The wedding chapel cost $3 million, all the hard and all the soft costs, $3 million. Can you imagine when I sit down with these couples, or all the teaching pastors and all the ordained pastors, and now there's, there's nine of us, and Andrew Frazier's going to be in this, this November. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be 10 of us. There'll be 10 of us who can do weddings. And I thought that was brilliant to get a couple more of these guys ordained, and I thought we'd all get a little bit of a break. I had four weddings like three weeks ago. Sometimes when you don't see somebody on stage, you don't see somebody preaching, it's their week to do weddings. And whatever week you have, you do all of them. So about a month ago, I had four. 
I wasn't preaching, but I had four weddings. Everybody on Sunday morning said, oh, you've got a great weekend off. And I just smiled, you know. I had four weddings, for crying out loud. Three million dollars, I tell these couples, so we could do this equipping for free. It's free. We sit down with each one of these couples, and it is absolutely free. They hear the gospel. They don't have to agree with it, but they're going to hear it. And the seeds are planted, and the seeds are sown, and the seeds get into different people's hearts. And you've, you've done that. We've paid cash. We're debt-free on the wedding chapel. And, and the amount, yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. The amount of premarital equipping sessions that we're doing. So Crystal talked about how many weddings we've done, and she said that means we've also done that many equipping sessions. What we've also done is even the couples who don't get married here, so far, about another 25%, we've done all the equipping for, for free. So these couples would say, oh, we'd love to go through this, but we already have a destination wedding. Come on. Come on. Our goal is to do as many couples as we possibly can, and you are making that possible. I'm so proud of you. I mean, I would clap and cheer. And I wouldn't kiss you, but I kiss most of you, okay? I'm so excited. So there's a reason why God created marriage. We need you to know it. We need you to embrace it. We need you to memorize these five C's and be able to clearly communicate this at home, to your kids, to your grandkids, at work, to your neighbors, to the schools. There's a reason why God did what he did. And we're just missionaries and spies in the land telling everybody what God's doing and how he's doing it. Well, why don't you stand with me and let's have the prayer partners come down front and maybe today as a couple you want special prayer. Maybe today as a couple you're going, I don't have a clue what our mission is. We never thought about an adventure before. So you come down today, get prayed up, get prayed over, and God will reveal truth to you. God, you start off with a marriage in Genesis, you end with marriage even in a book of Revelation, you talk about the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, my goodness. It's just all, it's in, Adrian did it today during communion with the Song of Song, Solomon. Lord, it's all there in the book. It's right there in front of us. Let us humble ourselves so that you can lift us up. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If this ministry has blessed you in any way and you feel led to give, you can go online to harborsidechurch.org slash give, or you can text Harborside to 77977. Thank you and have a great day.